Welcome back to Crafted Entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur and an investor definitely isn't for the faint of heart. And that's why I'm so excited to have our guest today, Natalie Frank on the podcast to talk about her upcoming book, Gutsy. We talk about everything from what it was like hearing the words, you have a brain tumor and how to overcome the problems that come along with being vulnerable in today's social media climate, how to take action on your business, despite the fact that, you know, risk are risk is required. We also talk about really what it takes to build a thriving community. And I think her definition of community and what it takes to build one is actually going to surprise you. So buckle up. You're going to love this episode. Get ready to enjoy Miss Natalie Frank. Welcome back to Crafted Entrepreneur. I am so excited for you to be a part of this show today. Today we have Natalie Frank. Welcome, Natalie, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. So you are best known for, you know, creating the Rising Tide Society. And I remember I used to follow that account like years ago on Instagram. And they've since been acquired by HoneyBook. Is that right? Yes. Yes. What a cool story. How did that happen? Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, Rising Tide has been a huge passion project and piece of my heart over the past almost eight years now. And uh, for a little bit of backstory for folks who aren't familiar, we started a community back in 2015, kind of at this moment where, you know, I was a full-time photographer running my business. I had scaled it and kind of, I, I describe it like I checked off every success you know, box that you can Mm -hmm. on a checklist of to do's. And from the outside looking in, you would think, okay, this business owner has made it. This entrepreneur is killing it. Like she's doing really well. But on the inside, you know, I I was deeply lonely. I felt so isolated. I felt like, you know, the only people who could understand were other business owners that were doing what I did, but they were considered competition. And back in 2015 in particular, you know, you did not talk to your competition. It was an environment where, you know, there wasn't as much business owners supporting business owners, people being open. There's a lot of gatekeeping, a lot of fear and scarcity mindset. And so essentially Rising Tide was born out of that. It was not born out of like a joyous, we love community, let's all come together. It was born out of this is broken. And we need to fix it. We need to bring people together. We need to fight for community in a landscape of competition. We need to believe that there is something bigger and better out there for us. So Rising Tide started from that place, started you know, in that season. We hosted a meetup here in my hometown of Annapolis. And then friends of mine saw it and started hosting their own meetups. And before we knew it, it was spreading rather quickly, which leads into, you know, in particular, where HoneyBook came in. We have been trying to find a path to sustainability for the community and connected with a bunch of different companies over the course of several months. And with HoneyBook, you know, everything just sort of happened really naturally. We aligned on values and realized that there was an opportunity here for this company that, you know, it's a client flow management platform. HoneyBook supports all service-based business owners, everything from hay to pay in a business, if you want to think of it from that perspective. So like everything from hay to pay, supporting business owners and running their operations, contracts, invoices, communications, you name it. They really had an interest in wanting to see independent business owners succeeding and coming together and kind of elevating that, that economy. And likewise, we were doing that work, but just volunteering it, right? Like like trying to find out how to scale that and make it more accessible to more people and um, do it for free, like not charge people to meet up in cities all over the world. We wanted to facilitate something that was truly accessible, like free. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, like it just was sort of a star alignment and you know, HoneyBook partnered and and eventually like acquired Rising Tide. And I was able to go full time into leading Rising Tide and came on as head of community and did that for a number of years and built a team and passed it along. And, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's been a journey. I'll leave it there. I'll have to say yes. And a lot, a lot has gone in seven years, um, you know, throughout that journey to kind of see the community grow and change and my own, you know, career as well, grow and change alongside it. 
I love that. I mean, I think a part of like building a community, so many people want to be able to build successful communities, but I feel like very few actually succeed in doing it. What is one thing that business owners should do to really create community around, you know, their industry, their people, their customers? Yeah. I mean, look, it all starts truly from asking yourself why. Why should this community exist? Why do you think you want to be a part of bringing that to life? You know, I I really believe that there is a difference between a community that is created for a deeper purpose and one that is created around a brand or around a leader or around an individual. Not that the two have to be mutually exclusive. But I do think the term community is thrown around a lot in reference of like, you know, um, influencers or creators calling something a community that's actually an audience. Now, there are content creators that have true community. And I think that those are extraordinary and you see them. And when you see them, you know, like you, when you see them, you know, because it's not just an audience of people, even that buy from them. It's like, a a group of people that will fight to the death, right? To defend and support that believe they're, they're working towards something larger than themselves. I think the term is thrown around a lot, but I think, again, it's about getting to the why. If you truly want to build community, I'd ask you why. Why do you truly want to build community? And I need you to be honest in your answering because I think sometimes there's an answer that's like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do to grow this business. And in that case, I would say, stop calling it a community. It's an audience and actually think about it as a marketing vehicle. Because otherwise it's disingenuous. Like to, to call it a community in that regard, if it's truly like the intent and the desire there is I need to scale and grow this business, then, you know, really be honest with yourself as an entrepreneur about the why. Don't romanticize it. Truly, I mean that. Because I do think there are so many spaces where communities are desperately needed and it can't be for profit. It can't be for individual gain. We are living right now through a loneliness epidemic. The Surgeon General came out relatively recently and said that this is one of the largest concerns facing the United States of America. We are in a moment in time where people are more disconnected. They are more isolated. They are more lonely and they are yearning for connection in the chaos of modern life. And so there is this need. I say this from a place of like, we need more people building community, but it has to be about the why. Why are you doing it? Why is there a need? What are people struggling with? Get to the, the core and the heart of it. And if you start there, it will lead to clarity. There's no right or wrong. You know, like when it comes to, especially I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm saying this in the lens of like, you know, there, there's no right or wrong answer when you ask that why. There's only the truth. So, so lead towards that truth and figure out like, why do you really want to start this community? And as I said, just to recap, if it is for business growth, then let's think about it as an audience and let's actually build funnels and let's let's market, truly market, but not look at it as a community unless there is also or only that deeper purpose and why, in which case, you know, it, it really gets into the core tenets of building community, the most basic and fundamental elements of, of constructing and creating, you know, a, a space where people can come together and and truly belong. And and I think, you know. And I know that's a hot take, by the way. I recognize that that is a hot take. But after having done this for almost a decade, and even in reflecting on my own successes and failings in this space, like that would be my genuine answer. I don't know if that that's probably not what you were expecting. No, but. I love that because, I mean, it goes back to why are you even building a business, right? Yes. You have to understand your why. And, it, and you're like, it can't be for profit because if you build a business for profit, you're never, it doesn't lead to happiness. You know, it's like, you know, my brand before this was mommy millionaire and it was like chasing millions, you know what I mean? But like all these people were like just chasing the dollar and not really chasing the purpose. And so that's why I had to completely rebrand into crafted entrepreneur. I'm so Mm. excited about it, but it's like creating a new community of people who really want to craft their own version of success and whatever that means to them. But it just is about going all in on your dreams, right? Going all in unapologetic and having fun what are the fundamentals of a community? Like, how do you know that it's actually a community and not an audience? Because I'm thinking already like of people I follow online, you know, where I'm like, yeah, that is a definite audience. And to me, I'm like, community is like, they do things for each other too. So that's exactly what I was going to lean into. So one of the biggest indicators is whether or not the members of that community are connected to one another. If their only connection point 
is that individual, right? That's more of an audience. That's like individual to the masses. If that community though has either opportunity or, you know, goes out of their way to create that opportunity to connect with one another and actually invest in one another, that is where we start to see communities happen. And again, I think it's nuanced, but if we're trying to sort of zoom out and, and, you know, create some sort of differentiating language, that's what I would lean into is, you know, if it's individual to mass, that's an audience. If it's, you know, individual to masses, but the masses also are building into something, they're connecting, they're sharing ideas, they're growing together. That is where you begin to move into community, community territory. And, you know, I, I've seen that happen. I've actually seen com audiences like become true communities over time as you know, that that group of people has the ability to connect further with one another or they mobilize and meet up in cities. I think, you know, somebody actually like Jen Hatmaker is a really good example of somebody that has a community, like runs a book club and they connect and they actually share with one another and they meet up in cities. And there's sort of this element, whether digital or in person, I think that is the joining of forces of the people who you know, are a part of that group. And within that comes things like, you know, the ability to see themselves as a member, like to truly identify. Oftentimes you'll see um, language develop. So people will call themselves a blank as mm -hmm. a reference to that community. Sharon McMahon is a, another great example. Her community, it's a community, it's not an audience. They call themselves the governor. There's over a million of them, right? <sighs> and, you know, they have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions at this point for philanthropic causes. But that's not what she does. She's a government teacher. She teaches on the United States government and law. But the people who follow her, the governors, have become a true community in the sense that they want to go out and do good in the world. And there's more happening there even than what she can provide. Like it's a living organism, right? Yeah. It takes on a life of its own, right? Yes, absolutely. So you built up Rising Tide to an incredible amount of people. How did you know what to value that community at when you started to have conversations with HoneyBook? Oh, I've never been asked that question. And, you know, to be really honest, I don't think I knew. I, I think in retrospect, I had no freaking idea. And it was not just me, by the way. We, you know, there were four co-founders. The way we leaned into that entire conversation was pretty simple. If we don't find a way to make this community sustainable, it's going to end. That's where we were. You know, to be like really honest with you, Rising Tide, as I mentioned, you know, it's never, never generated a profit, was never supposed to. The whole point was there's a problem and we want to unite and ignite volunteers to come together to fix it. Can we do that? But the problem is, you know, at a certain point when you're talking about hundreds of cities and you're talking about building infrastructure and I mean, there was a cost to that and not just a time cost, like a genuine cost. So I don't know that I really did understand the the value of that, you know, in a traditional sense. I, at that stage in my life, I mean, you know, was still very much a baby entrepreneur. I didn't even know much about acquisitions. We really just wanted to see the community continue. We didn't want it to die. And we were tired of doing these one-off partnerships to sort of fund it and, you know, not to go too deep on that track, but it's really hard to find a brand that you align with that, you know, you really understand the values. You feel strongly that there is a same desired vision for the future. And we would partner one off with certain brands and find out later that maybe some of those things weren't. Uh, you know, as, as in alignment as we thought going into that particular partnership. And so we wanted a, a, a space that we could really lean into and invest in. And, you know, HoneyBook for us was that space in that company and, and it has been for, for several years. And so, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say to you, like, there's some easy quantifiable metric that you can use, but we hadn't generated a dollar. We were, if anything, to be really honest, if anything, we were an expense that HoneyBook was adding to its, um, you know, like, because that's the reality. Yeah, There's still value in in the community. And over the years, it has been tremendously valuable to help, you know, just provide more to independence and create the, the vision of the future that we had hoped for. Now, community over competition as a concept is 
very much, you know, in the mainstream when back then it was a hashtag we came up with and no one had ever heard of it. And people laughed, literally laughed us out of the room. I mean, there were blog posts written about me that said things like, you know, this is the most naive concept I've ever heard. Business, I mean, I remember it because I cried about it, right? Like oh. business owners will never support one another. If we are competitors, I want to tear you down. I want to rip you apart. There is no way I would tell you anything about how to run a business. I remember reading that and feeling so devastated and yet still believing that there could be something better. So, right. you know, I think again, like we really didn't know how to value it. Uh, I, I yeah, love that. I mean, that's just the, the truth, man. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because it's you, you, you started out to solve a problem and then you were acquired to still solve a problem. It was still, you know, on that path. And it sounds like you had to overcome so much on this whole journey. And I feel like it's constantly, we're constantly overcoming, overcoming, but you've overcome things from a benign brain tumor diagnosis. You had yeah. neurosurgery and then you mm -hmm. battled years of infertility so can we talk a little bit about like what was going on in your life? Where were you at in your entrepreneur journey when you received your tumor diagnosis? You know what I love about this question is that so often I am asked about professional successes and that's like what 99% of people look at, but everything you just mentioned was happening at the same time. Wow. These aren't feeling. happening in silos, right? Like, yeah, this it's not like, oh, I am, you know, I was a, a six-figure wedding photographer. I was doing a quarter million quarter of a million dollars a year in my wedding photography business when we launched Rising Tide. Rising Tide took off. It was acquired by HoneyBook. You know, this was what, seven, eight years ago. I joined HoneyBook. And then from there, my career has grown. I've done two books, things like all these big professional things. I'm always asked about it. But the reality is a lot of hard things were happening behind the scenes. You know, yes, I was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor that was located, you know, in my pituitary gland and it was a macro tumor. So in the brain, there's micro and macro. Mine was on the larger side of things. Simultaneous to that, you know, was told there's a, a really good likelihood that depending on how we handle that tumor, I may or may not be able to have biological children. And that exact same year, like I'm getting married to my high school sweetheart, right? Like there's all of that happening at once. Mm -hmm. You fast forward and you know, five years, I think from that diagnosis is when I realized that it was time to move forward with surgery. And got a new medical team out in San Francisco, California, and we went forward with brain surgery. And that was one of the scariest seasons of my life. I mean, the absolutely most terrifying seasons. And I was, you know, two years post-acquisition living in San Francisco, working at HoneyBook in that moment. Like we were, Rising Tide was still growing and scaling and we were still trying to figure out how to do anything. And I mean, it, it was a really rough moment. And then I had to recover from that. And I had complications like I developed diabetes insipidus after surgery. I had adrenal insufficiency. You'll hear my, vo my voice is a little raspy. I still have inflammation issues, chronic health issues, wow. you know, because I had a brain tumor. So there's a lot that happened in that. And then, you know, I, we talked about IVF and infertility and, you know, it wasn't until I think seven years into our, almost seven years into our marriage that I was even able to start fertility treatment because of my brain tumor. And that was, again, like seven years without any success. And so it was a journey. It was such a journey. And it, th these things in our lives, you know, the things that you're going through, they don't happen separate of, right, the business that you're building. We're not, I'm not two different people. There's not Natalie, the entrepreneur, and then Natalie, the wife, mother, sister, and friend. There's just Natalie. And it's messy and it's imperfect. And there are days where you know, I do really great at one area of life. And then in other areas, I'm not doing so well. Heck, there are days where I'm just not doing so well in any area of life, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think it's, it's really beautiful that you ask that question because it's important for anyone listening to this. If you've ever felt like, wow, the entrepreneurs that I look at and I admire, like they've just got it all going on. But me, I have all these other things I'm struggling through. I am, you know, all like messy and imperfect and flawed and failing at this thing or struggling in this thing. And I just hope you know that there is always more to the story. And I hope you know that that is, you know, hopefully both comforting, but also beautiful and exciting. I, I wouldn't go back and change a single thing that I've walked through. Not the, you know, obviously not, not the successes, but certainly, certainly not the pain either. 
What was the most surprising lesson you learned through that experience of having the brain tumor and and living with it for several years and then, you know, going through surgery? I learned a lot of things. You know, I learned that um, I had a nurse in the hospital that told me, you know, gratitude is a magnet for miracles. And I really had to cling to that in certain seasons where, and I still do at times where, you know, my soundtrack, my internal soundtrack can get negative like anybody else's can, you know, easily turn to, well, why me? And instead of, wow, like, why me? Like this is, I'm so grateful to be here, breathing, having a birthday, getting these wrinkles, pulling that gray hair out of my head because I'm (laughs) still able to pluck the occasional gray hair until it goes all gray. Like, those sorts of moments, right? So, so gratitude really is a magnet for miracles. And I think we have to root ourselves in that gratitude. That was one. The other really tough learning that I had was, you know, I was really good at building community for other people and I was not so good at building community for myself. And, you know, I, I think that um, oftentimes we become experts in the things we struggle with most. I see that all the time, you know, and, and for me, right, it was coming to, to terms with the fact that I had become really good at building community because I knew the pain very well. But then as I built it for other people, I really had to learn how to lean on others. I had to learn how to truly be vulnerable and sharing. You know, one thing we didn't talk about, but this is really important. I'm pretty open now about what I struggle with. Not perfectly so, but I try to be more vulnerable than I had been in the past. But for five years, I told no one that I had this tumor in my head. For five years, I kept that completely hidden in private. I mean, beyond my immediate family and my medical team, obviously, but I never shared about it online. I didn't tell most of my colleagues about what I was going through. It was truly need to know. And I was so afraid. I was so afraid of sharing it. But again, like going through this experience, when I had that surgery date scheduled, I realized that that was a real choice that I had to make. And I, I decided to err on the side of vulnerability and share my story and be open for the first time about it. And, you know, that again is a tenet of a true community. It's like, is it a space where you can be yourself, not the version of yourself that people expect from you, not the version you wish they saw, but really you, can you actually be yourself and be vulnerable? And for me, you know, again, like that was that learning is I wasn't so good at truly being vulnerable in community with others. I had to, to lean into that, um, to lean on others, to really carry the weight of the struggle because that is what community at the end of the day is all about. It's not just about, you know, the Instagrammable moments where you see a group of women, men, people gathering together, having a good time, having a drink. Like that's when we think community, I think sometimes that's the image that populates in our mind. But what I learned and what I learned by realizing I wasn't so good at building community for myself was that the true picture of community is in my head today, you know, a room full of people with their arms around you because you can't carry yourself any longer. Like, Real community is there for us when things aren't going so well. And, you know, it's it's very rarely the first thing we think of, but I think that was one of the biggest learnings is like, that's that's where the rubber really hits the road. That's where we need community the most. That's beautiful. And I can just see that picture of people coming around you in that moment. Now, I always have to go to the other side too. What were maybe the negative things that you kind of experienced because you decided to be vulnerable, if any? Well, we don't have all day. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, I'll say a couple things. Um, and I, God, I love your questions because really when, when asked about vulnerability, all of us have a tendency to talk about the power of it. There is a cost and that's kind of the whole point. And that's kind of what I think most of us are afraid of. The, some of the negative, you know, People giving opinions where I didn't need them. People, you know, jumping to conclusions where they shouldn't have. That was always really hard. Even around, you know, my diagnosis and I, I, I shared as much as I felt comfortable sharing, but people sometimes wanted more. And, you know, they, they feel kind of, they begin to feel, entitled. May, yeah, maybe entitled to that information about you. So, you know, th- those were all negatives. But what I will say is that, the positives far outweighed the negatives. You know, for every one person that was unkind or kind of maybe too nosy, there were 10 that desperately needed to know they weren't alone. 
And that's for every part of the journey. I mean, even to this point, I still get people that reach out to me who are early on in this, you know, benign brain tumor diagnosis who are being told that there is no chance for them to even start IVF or have biological children or um, that it's not a possibility. And they're just desperate to find one human being out there that has gone through what they've gone through who has a different story than what they're being told, right? And it doesn't mean that it will happen for them. And it doesn't mean that, you know, my journey will be parallel to everyone else's. It doesn't mean, you know, in, in so many ways, but it gives them the hope, right? And, and in, it gives them someone to talk to. It, and I've been, I can't even tell you, it's almost, you know, every other week I get a message from somebody um, and I'm in a bunch of support groups for different things that I've gone through or that I'm a part of. And that makes it worth it to me. Like if one other person feels less alone, heck, even just, you know, removing stigmas around conversations about reproductive health and needing to go through treatment. Like this is something that I, I was raised in, you know, a, a Catholic family. I was raised in the Catholic church to say you didn't talk about infertility treatments an understatement. It's, it's not permitted. And so there was a lot that I pushed through and a lot of negative that I, yes, dealt with, but also the ability to be someone that is safe for others now, to be someone who can empathize, who doesn't meet you with judgment, but instead just meets you with love and that you're not alone, which that sentence can be sometimes a lifeline that we need. That to me is the positive. And it has far outweighed, you know, any sort of criticism or negative input. And there's one other thing I'll say to this. A lot of the negative um, becomes pretty unimportant when you begin to realize that the opinions that surround you matter far less than the opinion that you hold of yourself. How you feel about yourself, why you do what you do, and the integrity that you have for you know knowing that and standing by that is far more important than what you know some person six steps removed from you has to say in a comment about you on your social media. We can lose sight of that. And it can be really easy to care so much about the opinions that others have and to be so afraid about what they're going to say. But you're never going to live your life and move forward in your life if you're always listening first to the opinions of others. You have to get really clear on what's in here. And for each of us, that'll be different, right? Like we all have those different compasses and North Stars and it could be faith. It could be, you know, anything. But getting clear on that and starting from there, it really makes some of that other stuff, that noise, it just turns down the volume on it. It makes it less important. And I think that's really, truly, you know, something that all of us, truly like every human I've ever met, something all of us can work on and lean into. And um, hopefully take away, you know, when we lean into vulnerability. I love that. And I wanted to ask that question because it, we talk so much about the positive and the gratitude and all of those things when reality is there's some things that are hard about stepping into your calling and really living a big life. And I love that you're pointing out that the goodness outweighs the negativity, but you have to wire your brain to focus on, you do. on what the good you know, the good parts of it. And That's not our default. You've, <laughs> you've called yourself a neuroscience nerd. And I have to ask you this because I'm, I, my background is I was an ER nurse. So I'm super into all of the neuroscience. I love, I could geek out on this stuff too. So I want to hear in your point of view, how our brains are wired to stop us from taking risk. Right. And in Everything that requires us to have a successful business is taking risk, right? So <laughs> how, um, how does that work in our brains and how can we move past it? Yeah. So on the most simple, truly most simple level of this, the, the best way to think about this is your brain wants to keep you alive. That is its job. Okay. Its job is to keep you alive. And what ultimately could jeopardize that risk? Um, you know, I really like, and again, that's super, that is the most simplified version of it, but it's so critical to understand that because anything else we talk about from that jumping off point has to be kind of understood through that lens. Even, you know, as we were just talking about concern about what other people think, a really good example of this is precisely that. Whenever I hear the advice given that says something along the lines of, ah, just take the risk. Don't worry about what people think. Like, don't care what they have to say about it. It's missing the fact that you will always care 
about what people think. Your brain's wired that way. Why? Mm -hmm. Because human beings are social creatures. Um, the most, actually, truly, like one of the riskiest things that can happen to a human is, you know, ostracism from the group. Is actually being rejected from the community, from the tribe, from the the family. Exile equals certain death. The human brain is very much set up to do everything in its power to prevent you from being ostracized and outcast and ridiculed because that can lead to a loss of status, a loss of power, a loss of autonomy, and all of the terrible things that we've just mentioned. And throughout the course of human history, nothing good ever came from being exiled. And so your brain will overreact into, into kind of doing certain things to protect you from that. It does not want that to happen for you. Now, someone leaving a mean comment on my YouTube isn't going to equal certain death, okay? But my brain, right, is still wired to, to make me kind of pause and, and actually question using sort of that prefrontal cortex. Ooh, should I say that? Ooh, is, is, is that the right approach? And what can happen? And actually, my, my next book, Gutsy, comes out in August, and I talk a little bit about the neuroscience of this in Gutsy. But when you care too much about what people think, it can actually stop you from taking risks altogether, even the most benign of risks, because it kind of overstimulates your inhibition response. It overstimulates that part of your brain that is asking the question, oh, but should I do this? Oh, but what will they think? To the point where you can't even take action. You can't even move forward. And so, you know, we have to kind of just acknowledge first and foremost that our brain's not trying to hurt us. No, our brain's actually trying to protect us, right? We cling to our comfort zone because we feel as though it's safer than whatever's outside of it. That may not actually be the truth, but because we don't know what's outside of the comfort zone, we're going to do whatever we can to stay within it. And so you're absolutely right from the standpoint too of like, we have to take those conscious moments of decision-making to step beyond the comfortable, to take the risk, to move forward. And I actually call it good friction. Like we need a little bit of good discomfort and good friction in our daily lives. It's, it's really, really good for us and good for our brain. And it can be simple things like, you know, an improv class right? Pushing ourselves outside the comfort zone. It can be doing that thing that makes you the tiniest bit nervous. If something makes you a little nervous and it's relatively safe otherwise, when you're you know, aware, you're consciously aware of the activity, do it. It could be exercise. Exercise is good discomfort, right? Unless you're like me and you do yoga and you get stuck in a position and like pull every muscle in your body. I'm just so <laughs> terrible at yoga, although I love it. Um, good discomfort. And it's, you know, cold plunge. People are all into saunas. These are all things that cause like just a little bit of good friction, a little bit of good discomfort. It is so healthy for us as humans to kind of lean into that, right? And to find those places where we can take these micro risks to train our brain into acknowledging, wow, we are capable. Wow. You know, if we step, take one step outside of the comfort zone, we are able to move forward. We are able to see more, live more, do more, be more if that's what we want. And those other things are always going to be there, the concern of what other people think, the you know fear of the unknown. But we learn to move forward anyway, right? And we develop the pathways that enable us to take more risks, to know ourselves better, to have the self-efficacy, to trust that we are capable, to trust that you know I, I can trust myself in these moments where there is uncertainty. That in and of itself, is such a gift. Like if you can give one gift to yourself out of this episode, let it be the gift of trusting yourself enough to take the risk, to building up to a place where you truly do understand your own intuition around a decision that you have to make of whether the risk is worth it or not. And that can be by doing short little micro risks along the way to get into that uncomfortable position and, and really build more awareness within yourself. Oh my goodness. Now I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, okay, what's a micro risk that I can take today? Cold plunge. I have one in my garage that I do not do enough. So I might go do that later. <laughs> yeah. You did a recent post on Instagram about how you run your business today won't be the way you run your business in the future. So yep. how often are you taking a look at the systems in your business and making adjustments? All the time. Even today, today I was doing more research on ChatGPT4 and how to be leveraging it more thoroughly throughout different areas of my business. Um, I am just like a huge nerd when it comes to embracing change and being as much as I can at the forefront of it whenever possible, AI being a, a very recent example of that, trying to kind of understand 
you know, what will be the impact of AI on creative jobs? What will be the impact of AI within the business, within the independent business? Um, even the work I do with HoneyBook, you know, we're looking at how to make platform, our platform, you know, more intelligent. Is there a space for us to do certain things to just power the business owner to get back to doing what they love? Um, you know, all of that to say often, I am always looking for ways to update my systems because I feel really strongly about the why, you know, as we've talked about throughout, you know, if, if it's simply a matter of I love tech, so therefore I must optimize, that's not me. Um, if anything, I think I'm more often frustrated with technology than I am in love with it. And I'm saying that as someone that works in tech, like it's, <laughs> it's a very frustrating process, building tech, using tech, adapting, learning, having to change everything all over again. Like it's not comfortable. We talked about discomfort. Um, it's not about the tech. It's about the fact that I have a lot of clarity around the most precious resource in my life. And that is time. Time is the most precious currency that we have. It's worth more than money, frankly. Um, it, it, it always will be. You can always make more money. You can never get more time. Learning that will radically transform the way that you approach things. And so for me, I am someone that really challenges excuses around, well, I just don't have time to when it comes to technology in my life, in my business. Because I used to do that all the time. I'd say, oh, I don't have time to set up that automation. And then I realized, well, if I had just set up that automation six months ago, it would have saved me X hours. And it would have only taken five minutes six months ago, right? Like that realization, and I talk about this on, on social too, where if you're wasting 45 minutes a day, if you have 45 minutes of inefficiencies, which frankly, we mo most of us have a lot more than that, um, <laughs> you know, 45 minutes of inefficiencies over the course of your career is over a year of your life. It's over 400 wow. days of your life. 45 minutes, that's it. 45 minutes translates into a year. And, you know, having gone through brain surgery in particular, like there was a very big realization that I had in, in like the days leading up to surgery where I remember thinking like, I don't know what life's going to look like on the other side of this. And I'm very well aware of all the potential risks of going into brain surgery. What I wouldn't give for just more time, like a guarantee that I'm going to have more time on the other side of this. Sorry, like gets me, it gets me like a little bit um, choked up because I don't think most people realize that, right? Like it takes us going through something really hard to have that realization of like, you're not promised more time. None of us are. So please like stop putting things off. Please like do whatever you have to do to reclaim your time within your business as an entrepreneur because it's it's the most important thing to spend doing the things that bring you joy with the people that you love, you know, building something that actually makes an impact on this world. That, that is, is where it matters. Not, you know, typing out an email, not like, you know, not automating something because it's, there's fear in letting go of control, like systematize, automate, do, do it all. Whether you use HoneyBook or any of our competitors, like, I don't care what you use. And I'm a big, if you ever hear me talk, it, whenever someone asks me like, why should I use HoneyBook? I'll say, I'm never going to like fight to sell you on HoneyBook. I'm going to fight to sell you on the fact that you need client flow management. I'm going to fight you to, to see the power in leveraging technology in every area that you can because your time is worth it, because you are worth it, right? So for me, that's what it comes down to. I do it frequently. I do it often. Um, I'll go through the frustrating aspects of changing a system or adding an automation and testing it out because I know that if I can save even 15 minutes today, that 15 minutes with my daughter, with my son, with my husband, it is worth it. It is absolutely worth it. It always has been and it always will be. I love that. And, you know, you had to go through a life threatening circumstance to get this realization. And it's such a gift that you're now on this podcast. So thank you for sharing that because it's like a lot of us listening and we, we just take for granted the fact that we have time you know, when we think we have a lot of time. And so it's a good reminder for me. It's a good reminder for everybody listening in right now to take the time to work on your business, to work on those systems, because what they do is they actually do give you more time, you know, to enjoy your life. And that's why we're doing it all in the first place, right? Is because we do, we want to enjoy our lives. I saw Vision who owns Mind Body or Mind, uh, what is it called? Mind Valley. I mean, he did a talk recently saying that, he believes somewhere in the near future that we will be going to 20 hour work weeks. Like mm. 
countrywide. Yeah. Do you believe in that same statement? I think that we need to dramatically change our perspective of work in this country. We need to dramatically update our our infrastructure to support the future of work. You know, I, look, our our system is still, you know, kind of built on an industrial revolution that is v- not as relevant, right? Like everything about our infrastructure is built for corporate work, W2 work, everything from health insurance, retirement savings, you know, all of it, truly parental leave, like everything is built into a corporate work structure that is support supposed to support the individual through employment. And every indicator, every single indicator is demonstrating the fact that Gen Z in particular is more entrepreneurial than any other generation before them. You know, over half of them intend to start a business in the next 10 years. When you look at rates of new business formation in the United States, there were record setting numbers in both 2021 and then 2022 didn't didn't surpass 2021, but it was still over 5 million new business applications. And again, we're talking about just staggering statistics year over year now. And so I say all of that to say the future of work is independent. Our infrastructure is not built to support it. And that has to change, let alone talking about work weeks. I mean, we look at things like AI and, you know, on my blog, I'm talking about Penn, where I went to to school, just came out with a study saying that, you know, so such a huge percentage of the workforce is going to have such a significant amount of their workday changed by AI and tasks that we're doing today. We just simply won't do, you know, months and years from now. And so I do think we need to reevaluate everything about work from how it, you know, affects our our daily life to where we get benefits and infrastructure. I don't have all the answers and I I you know, I don't I don't necessarily know when we'll make those changes, but what I do know is that technology is outpacing our infrastructure and it has been for a long time and what worked in the industrial revolution and I say worked with quotations because you know, again, like worked, putting it loosely, um, it it certainly isn't serving us today. And Mm -hmm. I think that there is a real opportunity here if we're willing to innovate. Uh, State of Maryland is where I'm at at right now. And I know that they're even looking into, hey, what about four-day work weeks instead of five-day work weeks? There's been those conversations emerging in many states and different areas. So I don't know that I maybe share that vision of like, you know, 20-hour work weeks. But what I do know is that we have to change. Um, The the time is coming, right? Like everyone goes, oh, in the future, we're living in it. Like AI is not the future, AI is here. Um, Independent work's not the future, it's here. The pandemic actually basically hit fuel to that fire of now people can work from anywhere. Their office is no longer, you know, bound to four walls in a corporate cubicle. Like we can expand our, our concept of what work looks like. We have to be willing though to make certain changes just to ensure that that future is one where people are truly able to thrive. Because as you know, I'm sure, and anyone listening to this knows, you know, the same technology that enables us to work from anywhere also comes at the risk of being on 24-7. We have to decide that we are going to change certain aspects of how we view work in order to ensure that the future is better than the present and therefore better than the past. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I feel like this strong... I've been thinking about this, like for my team in particular, like how do we, I heard the same thing about four hour work weeks. I mean, four day work weeks. And I'm like, gosh, I just, I don't know how that would work, you know, where you have customers who expect, they, they don't expect Monday through Friday. They expect Monday through Sunday, (laughs) you know, responses and stuff. So it's like, it's going to take a collective of everybody almost like changing what they you know, like the fact that we can door dash something at 11 o'clock at night is, is mind blowing to me. Right. Like those, I think about that all the time. I'm like, that's so sad that like the door dasher has been working 24 hours today, you know, to like pay the bills. And it's like, it's because there's a demand It's because we keep asking for it. And so they keep giving it to us. But I think there's a, there's a responsibility as entrepreneurs who are leading, you know, small teams, small businesses, to set the standard. And like you said, you know, you want to be on the forefront of the change. And I think this is something that, you know, me and you both, we could be at the forefront of that change of saying, Hey, you know, we might have employees and here's what we're offering full benefits, full this, and you're going to work less. Like, and I, I play with this in my mind all the time because I think, gosh, like my team would probably be 10 times more productive if they didn't work 40 to 
50 hours a week, you know? Right. right. So it's something I'm toying with and I'm trying to figure out how to actually make it work where everything still gets done. And I think AI is going to help with a lot of that. Yes. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't, it, it can't ever replace actual humans, you know, like that human to human connection, which is what we do a lot of at Crafted Entrepreneurs coaching, you know? Mm-hmm. We're playing with that aspect right now, but I just think it's an interesting conversation that more entrepreneurs need to be having, even if it's just planting the seed and just going, hmm, what, what could I do? Because then people want to work for you and they don't want to go out and do their own thing. Or maybe they have more time to do their own thing and help you succeed at your vision, right? So I think there's, it could be a win-win for everybody involved. You said something interesting lately. You could tell I stalk you, right? Uh, <laughs> you shared that your grandma told you not long before she passed away, uh, you had told her you want to make her proud, right? Mm -hmm. And what was her response? Yeah. So my grandmother was um, battling lung cancer and I was coming home from college at the time every weekend towards the end there, like the last couple of weekends to help. And uh, I did. I, I, you know, kind of asked her in a moment where I think I was just craving, truly craving validation. <laughs> I really hope that I make you proud. And, you know, she looked at me and my grandmother was very cheeky and she just said, Natalie, make yourself proud. Now, she wasn't trying to be rude to me. What she was saying was, you already make me proud. That's not important, right? Make yourself proud. Live a life where you wake up every day feeling proud of what you've done. People will always have their opinions of you, right? Like we've talked about, but your opinion of yourself is what matters most. And it was as if in that moment, I think I realized just you know, what, what she meant because I had spent so much of my life looking to my grandmother in particular for me was everything, you know, oh my gosh, I just, I hope I, I make her proud. I hope that, you know, I'm doing enough, that I'm good enough, that I'm achieving enough, that I'm, you know, again, like checking all these boxes, doing enough. And yet like I was always enough. I just had to see it for myself. And so it was, it was definitely a moment for me, I think, that I look back on to this day where it really changed everything. You know, I think I stopped chasing other people's ideas of success for my life. And I started really going after the things that I wanted. Like shortly after that, I graduated from college and I didn't go get the corporate job. I went full time into running a small business. And there were so many people that were shocked. They were like, you went to an Ivy League school and you just took that diploma and they literally were like, you're throwing it away to become an artist? Like, I, <sighs> I don't understand what you're doing. And, you know, it was like that moment where I could just hear her voice. And I remember thinking like, you don't need to understand. It doesn't matter if you understand. That's not what I'm trying to do is to help get you to understand. No, no, no. Like, I need to do this. I need to bet on myself. I need to see if I can do it because I will be proud of myself if I go out and do this thing, even if I fail. I will be more proud of myself if I go out and do this thing and I fail than had I stayed back and not done it at all. Like, I need to do this, even if it doesn't result in success, even if you can't understand it. And so, yeah, it was a, that, like, for me was a huge life-changing moment. And many decisions that have followed that in my life have been led by, you know, am I doing this because I'm trying to make somebody else think that I'm successful or believe in me or, you know, or am I really doing this because it's what I need to do? Because I, I at, the, at the heart of it, my integrity, right? Like I have to do this. Uh, and leading from that place of like going out into the world and, and fighting to make yourself proud first. Because oftentimes too, if you make yourself proud, right? Like that's really where she's most proud of me in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of those moments where I'm, I'm leaning into that and, and honoring that. What makes you feel proud about yourself right now? <sighs> Gosh, I'm doing so many things in my life that I was afraid to do for so long. And I don't mean big things. I just mean, you know, having the courage to have an opinion, to say no, to speak my mind, to um, stand up for myself. Something as simple as standing up for myself used to terrify me, truly. Like I'm an Enneagram three. I care about what other people think. We've established that. I wrote a book about it. Like that literally has been a life's journey of unlearning. 
And simply the ability to send an email that I sent this morning saying like, you know, that I disagreed with the decision. That is the kind of courage that makes me proud of myself. To other people, they could care less, you know, like to them, to some people, they're like, really saying no to somebody that makes you proud? Yes, it does. Uh, because it's easier for me to be a people pleaser and to try to bend over backwards for the world than it is for me to love by moving forward from the, that place of truth and integrity. And that's what matters most. So when I, when I live into that, especially when no one is watching, and I do that as often as I can, and I fight for it every single day. Like that's what makes me most proud. And then second to that, I would say, you know, my kids and the and and this is like again, I'm getting emotional, but um, let it out. I'm really proud that um, I've invested in a relationship with my husband to where, you know, my kids have the type of father that I had always dreamed of growing up. Like I'm really proud that we've invested in our relationship and we're fighting for it. I'm really proud of going to therapy throughout my adulthood and working on myself and becoming, you know, a mom that I want to be and um, being able to apologize to my kids when I screw up. I'm proud of that. Like these are maybe, I don't know, maybe silly things, but um, no, these are, they're, they're, these are what I'm really proud of. Like I'm being honest. <laughs> Yeah, no, those are the big things, right? Because it's yeah. it's things that nobody else will see, right? Ever. Ever. But they're the things that you have to live with. You, 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 it's like that saying, you take you wherever you go. I love and that. And so like when you could say like, gosh, I've stood up for myself. I've done this. Like you go to bed really easy at night. You know, you it's sleep so really true. good <laughs> because you're like, I, I stood up for myself. And when you stand up for yourself, you're, you're making a safe environment for your growth. And so I think that's a beautiful thing to be proud of. And I mean, I feel like we could have, we could go on forever because we didn't even get into like all the business and all of your genius in that way. But I feel like th this is what entrepreneurs need to hear is these types of conversations to like, let's take it back to the basics of why we started this in the first place. We all want to be happy. You know, we, we do, we all want to be happy and we want to be proud of ourselves. And I love that. It was definitely a reminder for me today, you know, because I have some big decisions I need to make and I'm like, what's going to make me proud? Not yep. what is going to make everybody else proud. So such a beautiful thing. And I am just, I'm grateful that you took the time to get on this podcast and tell everybody where they can find you at Natalie. Absolutely. So you can find me anywhere on the internet. Um, I am truly on all social platforms at Natalie Frank. My website is nataliefrank.com. You know, if you enjoyed this conversation, I highly recommend, you know, check out my book, Built to Belong. And then my uh, second book, Gutsy, is coming out in August. And it really, it's all about navigating the fear of what other people think of you and going out and doing the darn thing. And so there's a lot of nerdy science mixed in there. But it is probably, speaking of things I'm proud of, that book, Gutsy, it is probably one of the things I'm most proud of in my professional life. So oh, I- I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I really hope you read it and enjoy it. And if you do, let me know the impact that it's made on your life. Awesome. I'll make sure to pick it up and post it on social media too. So thank you, Natalie, so much. Thank you so much for having me.